Okay, I guess we're not going to because I don't have time to fix that. Whatever's going on. Piece of that cake. So we're going to jump right into this tonight. Mm -hmm. oh, there's a camera right there. Um, how many? How many of you right now are at least making an attempt at doing your your daily devotion and seeking Him? Anybody? Everybody, you're making an attempt? I'm a couple days mm -hmm. behind, but yeah. All right, I'm encouraged because, see, it's about seeking him together. And when you refuse to do these things as a, as a body, as a church, you decide you're going to have your own thing going on. And can I tell you that that's not what God's about? Did you hear what I'm saying? Yes. yes. As a matter of fact, turn your Bibles to Ephesians tonight because that's where we're going to be. And actually, tonight we're going to talk about this. Um, actually, some uh, uh, in, in many uh, Bibles you'll find, mine doesn't say it, but I know there are others that Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the unity of faith. Mm -hmm. Unity of faith. Amen? Amen? Say that word, unity. 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 Uh, let, me, let me share a few things here, um, but because as we've been going through this, uh, uh, the, the topics over the last couple of weeks, you know, and here's the thing, you're short-sheeting, anybody know what, not know what short-sheeting is? Yeah. You're shorting yourself if you're not, if you're not joining in with the body, and, and, and studying these things. So I can tell you, I've, uh, through this time, uh, as we're going through this process, I've had more people, more calls, and more conversation, real real conversations that are meaningful uh, about things. Because, uh, well, we started out, and, you know, we started talking about the first the first series was on revival. Who's it for? Uh, Stroll of hands, who knows who revival is for? Anybody? All right. Who's revival for? Christians. What? The Christian, the believer. The believers. Yeah. Revival is not for the non-believers. So don't you really can't force these things on an unbeliever. Somebody say, oh, me. Well, how can they oh, be revived if they didn't believe? That's, that's my point. Mm -hmm. And so um, some of it makes, well, just what I'm telling you right now, some of this makes way too much sense. So we started out with that, and then, then we talked about humility. Some of you really need to get a, get a, get a grip on that because the Bible says he resists the proud. And some of us, uh, you wrote, watch this, you got to know, well, number one, who you are, number two, and number three, okay, and you, another, so the idea here is you may have an idea what needs to be done, but you might not be in a position. You don't know who you are, you don't know where you stand, and you might say that you do, but you didn't know what the Bible talks about. There are those of us who deceive ourselves, and then we try to deceive others, but the idea is, yes, quickly. I just have a question. Yes. You know you're talking about being proud. Yeah. But when you did the service, you said it's okay to be prideful about some things. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay to be proud of things. You, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you've, you've had an accomplishment. You're proud. Right. Okay. So did, did you know God's proud? Okay. But there, there is a healthy side. There's a godly side of pride. Mm -hmm. All right. Because we're not, we're not talking. God's not trying to beat people down. What's He trying to trying to build His people up? And that's what we're supposed to do is truly be able to build one another up. So what happens is that the Bible says that He uh, He resists the proud, but to the humble, he what? Exalts he them. exalts them. Amen. And then we, uh, the next one, uh, let's see, the next one, the next one after that was honesty. And uh, if you, if you, if you haven't done this, you can't. You, you'll never. You're not going to understand what we're talking about. I, I don't know of any other time. Well, I do know some of the times, but this time around, it's, it's impacted me about honesty, about being. What is you shall know the truth. truth. Not a truth that you've conjured up. No, the truth of your relationship with God. In other words, knowing who you are, where you stand. Because if you don't have those two, it doesn't matter if you think you know what to do or not. Amen? Uh, and then, then the next one, which actually you should be in this week. Uh, and it's uh, <laughs> the, actually the, the one on truth and the one on repentance, which is where you're at now, right? That Those are probably, th those are, th they've, they've been digging deep, Okay. They, they've been getting us, and some of you are bored with this stuff. You're not even interested in it. And that's why you haven't jumped, and you're not diving into this. And I'm saying here, if you're not even making an attempt at it, if you're not even trying to make an attempt, you're, you're really shorting yourself. And so, um, and then now this coming week, which we're actually we're going to start talking about tonight, uh, it's preparing you, and I'll be preaching uh, on it as well, and that is grace. You know, and then after grace. So if you think about this, there, there seems to be an order to this particular study. First off, it tells us about revival. Who's it for? And then, of course, you know, it goes through humility, honesty, repentance. Uh, and you think about this, and, and it's going to move on to grace. Great grace. Somebody say great grace. Great, great, great grace. The grace of God. Okay? Amen. And, uh, and then after that, let me get uh, after that is one that's going to get a little bit deep as well, because we'll be 
studying holiness. <clears throat> and and, and I, I don't, I, well, I could preach on that for a minute. Um, the Bible says without holiness, you won't see God. Amen. It's true. Uh, you, you know, you can, feel, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. No. Right. Somebody say amen. 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 But let me, I'm going to back up because I want to bring us to where we are tonight. And, and tonight, I want to talk to you about grace. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things, and then we're going to focus on two things about grace. Uh, first off, um, in grace, in regards to grace, we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we look in the Bible, Old and New Testament. How many of you think that grace is all through the Bible, Old and New Testament? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's, and, and um, I mean, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I mean, I'm trying to see if I can put these words together properly. While the Bible does not appear to be uniform, it is unified. Did you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yes. As the Bible, it doesn't appear to be uniform, it is unified. I mean, there are a lot of books of this one Bible. Uh, it's kind of like the pennies in a jar, okay? You have pennies in a jar, and uh, you know, in, in one jar, and the pennies in the jar, they look the same, yet they're disconnected. They're not really connected in there. Where, and I'm trying, this is the best example I can give, but the books of the Bible are more like the organs of a body. Did you hear me? Yes. And see, let's, let's what I'm talking The books of the Bible are like the organs of the body. They look different, but they are interconnected. Now, tonight I mentioned the, the, the idea of studying about grace. That, that's the thing that unifies it. That's the thing that brings, it, uh, brings us together. And so when you think about this, um, we've had a couple of genera generations that... Uh, that I've been watching, I'm, I'm really kind of encouraged by it because we're, we're, I'm watching as they're trying to uh, recover the biblical theology that brings it all together. I mean, when you think about this, uh, the Bible, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a, not mosaic, uh, a motif. Uh, it, it, there, there's, it's a certain there's motif that there, there's courses through Scripture from start to end, and it's trying to bring things all together and... Uh, Another word I could use is, you know, we're, we're trying to weave this tapestry. I've heard somebody use that before, where you, you see this tapestry, and, and, it, and it's a coherent tapestry. That, that tapestry, which represents the kingdom, uh, the temple, the people of God, creation, new creation. Somebody say amen, and on and on and on. But underneath all of this, as the under, undergirding, it, it seems to me, it is that motif of God's grace, his favor, his love. And get this, it's his love to the undeserving. I mean, don't we see grace, the grace of God in every book of the Bible? Mm -hmm. I, I did a little study, and I, I've got this paper here. I, I, I don't know how many verses I've got, but I don't, and I had to stop because I ran out of time. But I'm just going to really quickly go through a few of these things because Genesis, let's start with Genesis. Genesis shows God's grace to a universally wicked world as he enters into a relationship with a sinful family line, Abraham. And it promises to bless, get this, it promises to bless the whole world. Not just his family, but through him, he would bless the whole world. Can I tell you that that idea and that thought and God's desire is the same thing? That through you, many would be blessed. Why? Because as you become men and women of God, not men and women of good ideas and good notions and good yeah. intentions, no, Truly, minimum of God. God can bless others through you. In Leviticus, it, uh, it shows God's grace in providing his people with a sacrificial system to atone for their sins. And listen, uh, it's like this. You know, he provided a cure. Well, not a cure. He provided medicine, in a sense, because you know the sacrifice never did, a, never did fully eradicate no. the problem. Did it? you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes to the New Testament, Jesus. Jesus, he's the one who came to take, a, to take away the sins of the world. In Deuteronomy, it shows God's grace in giving the people a new land, not because of their righteousness, but because of his. In Joshua, it shows God's grace in giving Israel victory after victory after victory in their conquest of that new land. Uh, with, listen, with, with, with neither superior numbers nor superior obedience on Israel's part, it was only because of God that they were, they were able to be victorious and, and to go take the land. Amen? And then Ruth. How many of you know the story of Ruth? Amen. This is, that's, this is one, of, one of my favorites. Uh, the book of Ruth shows God's grace in incorporating a poverty-stricken, desolate, foreign woman and, 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 um, 
and grafting her in to the line of Jesus. Amen? And first and second Samuel, God's grace is establishing the throne. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, so talking about establishing this throne for how long? Forever. And then in first Kings, first and second Kings, God shows grace. It repeatedly prolonging and exacting of justice and judgment for the kingly sin for the sake of David. Now, and remember, by the ancient hermeneutic preposition or of the corporate solidarity, I mean, you think about all this, the king represented the people. Did you hear what I'm talking The king represents the people. Now, we look, in the, we look at what happened. You see this, that King Saul, where he wasn't king until he was called king. Amen? And, he, and get this. The people picked him. Why did they pick Saul? Good looking. Good looking. He stood head and shoulders above everybody. You know, I mean, he was a warrior and all that kind of stuff. Of course, you know, David comes along. He's a little bitty guy. But did you know that David David was uh, already going to be king before it was all over anyway? There's a, there's certain characteristics. Now, David wasn't perfect, but he was still called to be king. Amen? Yeah. I mean, you can go on down through here. I found in Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms is absolutely filled with the grace of God. Proverbs, it shows us grace, uh, God's grace by opening up to us a world of wisdom in leading a life of happy godliness and then ecclesiastes you know that book of wisdom mm -hmm. uh it shows god's grace and love for his bride by giving us a faint echo of it in the pleasures of faithful human sensuality oh, i said it didn't i but understand this this is this is under the this under the heading of what god had planned it, this was not about some some sort of a, a just a physical uh, uh, incarnation? No, it, that wasn't what it was about. This is something absolutely spiritual and it's beautiful in the sight of God. Somebody say amen. 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 So tonight we want to talk about this grace thing. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read a little bit of it. Um, let's, let's start out here in uh, verse 2. Can I greet you tonight? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. amen. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, what? Holy, Holy. and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us uh, made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that according um, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. I don't know about you, but I, I'm sure sensing an awful lot of humility a humbling going on here and some of you need to really wake up to the fact that what this is about notice how many times it says him and his yeah. amen you know if we jump down to chapter two uh, it says and, and and you who am i talking about you me and me right. and, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince and power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. Jump on down, verse 8, because this is, this is where it comes, because it was God who was rich in mercy in verse 4. But go down in verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, <coughs> lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to jump back, and I, I don't think it's in your notes any place, but it could be. Uh, in, um, Romans chapter 5, because this is encouraging. Remember um, what grace is about. Grace, obviously, is the love of God for those who don't deserve it. You don't, How many of you think you deserve the love of God? No. no. I mean, I, we, don't, we don't deserve it, but he wants us to get it. He wants us to receive. See, this grace thing, is it, it, it is absolutely the embodiment of God's love in us. By grace you were saved, not of works. Okay, so, and, and this is encouraging to me because here, here again, uh, in, verse, in, in chapter 5 of Romans, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And you might say, boy, I'm feeling kind of weak. I'm feeling poorly. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're going to be there again. But understand this. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, so, there may be some people here, you not, might get a, an understanding of what I'm about to say right now. Some of us, we think that we're already so godly that Christ didn't die for us because we act like his, his sacrifice didn't mean anything. And I'm talking about pride once again. We need to humble ourselves in the sight of God. Amen. So I want to kind of get into this thing tonight just a little bit, and then we'll have a little discussion. Because I want to tell you two things that we all need to know about grace. Anybody want to know those two things? I mean, here's the thing. Um, an economist might say something like this. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as free lunch. I'll give you something else. There's no such thing as free medical care. There, it's, there's no there's no such thing as anything. Nothing in this world comes for free. I mean, freedom itself is not free. Even when we don't pay the bill, even when we're, we're not paying for it, there's a friend that picks up our meal or the friend that picks up that medical bill. There's a friend. Somebody is still paying for whatever it is. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Now watch this. Did you know that grace works the same way. Now, before you jump off of the cliff and you think that I'm saying, uh, you say, wait, grace is free. Uh, don't forget that grace was not free. Did you hear what I'm telling you? Grace was costly. Listen to what I'm telling you tonight, friends. Grace was costly. It costs God, his only begotten son. It costs Jesus his life. Aren't you glad that Jesus loved us? No, wait a minute. Why did he love us? Why did he love us? Because we loved him? No. Why did God love us? Because we love him? No. You know why, he, why Jesus loved us? Because he loved what his father loved. And even while we were yet sinners, even while we were yet without strength, God sent his son. And so what I'm telling you tonight, you can't earn what is free. You say, well, Pastor, you just said it wasn't free. But what, what does it mean for us? If, it, it means that we can't earn our salvation or we can't buy God's favor. Jesus paid the penalty of our sin. Well, here I go back again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made a bound towards us. He made a bound towards us. Jesus, being obedient to death on the cross, oh, absolutely opened up the windows of heaven for grace to be poured out on all, all people. Amen? Amen? So, salvation, if we think about this, it's a free gift. It's not from yourselves. I can't give it to you. Uh, I, I mean, I can point you in the way. Amen? 
Uh, I can point you to the one. It, but here's what really happens, though. I can speak till I'm blue in the face. I can, I can preach till I can't preach anymore. I can share until I'm out of wind. I can do whatever, but the bottom line comes to this. It is something that God gives to us. It's the Holy Spirit that brings you to Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? Points you back to his Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be his name. His kingdom come. His will. It, wait, there I go. All his. It's, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about it. Yes, it is. But what about me? Wait a second. Let me, let me flip this for you, okay? Did you know that he's all about you? He's all about all of us. Isn't that good? If we could just get our, wrap our minds around this, and it's difficult to wrap our minds around the grace of God. Why? He's beyond our figuring out. How could he love this one? How could he love that one? I mean, they don't deserve it. And some of us, we still got that kind of an attitude that somebody doesn't deserve it. And, and maybe you, you might even be one of those people. You say, well, I deserve it. As soon as you say that, you're in real trouble. The Bible says that God resists the problem. As a matter of fact, you might remember this. There is one, one verse what, uh, that, that tells you that God actually stands against the proud. He pushes against the proud. And you wonder why you're not able to move forward? The harder you try. Have you ever had this happen? The harder you try, the behind you, you know, the, the faster yeah. you run, the behind you get. Yep. Amen. <laughs> see, so what we see is that salvation comes by grace through faith. It's not earned. Here's one for you. It is not earned by attending church, but I will promise you that if you are saved, you'll want to be in the house of God with the people of God. To do anything otherwise is to, to absolutely just dis, disfellowship dis yourself from the thing that God ordained. Did you know that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for his bride? And male or female, well, today it can get confused because I guess men can be brides today too. But uh, anyway, uh, let me get back on this, back on task. You understand what I'm saying? He's coming for the bride of Christ, which is the church. You sit at home and you think that you're doing fine. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you read your Bible, which brings me to this. I don't care how much you memorize your Bible. I don't care how much you avoid drinking alcohol. I don't care how much you avoid smoking. I don't care how much you avoid watching these movies, reading these books and magazines. I don't care how much you do or don't do these things. No amount of good works is going to earn God's favor. You want to know the reason that we shouldn't be doing these things? I mean, there's a lot, long list of things. There's a, there's a long list of things we probably shouldn't be doing because we have God's favor. Now, I want to give you something because some say, well, this whole, this faith thing, this, this living life of faith, living a Christian life, it's hard. Well, it is if you're trying to do it on your own. <laughs> but did you know that God did something for us as well? Did you know that he said, listen, I'm asking you to live like this, but I'm not leaving you alone. You are not to be doing this on your own. Some people say, well, you know, that's all. I just, me and God, I, we, me and God, we got this, you know. <laughs> I know you like that, didn't you? I know. We got this. Wait, hold on. Watch this. Did you know what, what Jesus says? Did you know what the command says? Love God, love others as yourself. Did you know that we have on the top of our bulletin, love God, love self, love others. Serving God while serving others. Amen. And where are you going to be able to do that? There's no better place to do it than in the houses of worship, than in the house of God. Amen? Amen. And so I'm here to tell you that God, <laughs> no amount of any good work that you do can make God love you any more than he already does. I mean, God can't love you any more than he already does. Right. What do you, what do you expect? Wait, he already gave his son. His son, loved, his son loved you as much as his father did, and he died for you and me. Amen? I mean, if we miss this, we're going to spend our entire lives trying to earn something that we already have available for free. But it wasn't for free, just to, just to make clear. I mean, it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to say this. It's like that person who searches for their glasses that are already... On their head. <laughs> Anybody else ever do this? Yes. yes. What, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my phone. You yeah, see my yeah phone? I know. It's right in your hand. But do you understand what I'm saying? 
It's already there. Instead of joyfully, listen, instead of joyfully finding out how we can graciously serve a gracious God together, we're going to find ourselves slave to fear and doubt, spending our time trying to grasp and maintain God's approval. That's why I'm saying, you know, and I'm encouraging you. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a mandate, but I'm here to tell you that this is, that I'm going to call it the program. I don't like it so much, but it's a process whereby if, the, the, if this little body of believers could just get on the same page. Did you hear what I'm telling you? So the first thing is you can't earn what is <laughs> you can't earn what is already free. That's the first thing about grace. And let me give you something else. I hope this helps you uh, reconcile some things in your mind about um, a particular doctrine that is uh, pur purported and and, and, and portrayed in a way that is not biblical, and it's eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Now, if I told you there is some truth to that, I mean, you would say, yeah, there is some truth to that. Some truth. But if, if it's only some truth, truth mixed with a lie is still a lie. A lie. Mm -hmm. I want you to get it beyond that because I want you to know the truth. Because sometimes grace is hardest when we have messed up the biggest. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. I mean, when we sin, we feel, well, we feel bad. We, uh, we feel, um, and rightfully, we, we regret it because, well, maybe it hurts your heart, or maybe you really realize that we've hurt God, the God that we say we love. Convicted, and we want to earn his. Listen, and then what happens? We make an effort to try to earn his love back. I mean, like the husband that brings flowers to his wife to reconcile after they had a fight. We want to bring God something that will appease him. You remember in the Old Testament they did these sacrifices. It did not wipe away sin, but it did appease God. And held, he held back his wrath at the moment. Wait, he was still angry, though. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. You see, so what I want you to understand is there is nothing that we can bring to God to change his disposition towards us. It is not your behavior that merits grace. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He says, the Christian does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Now, I get this because, uh, and you know, you'll hear this preached. You got to do your first works over. Mm -hmm. You know, you turn, you've turned from your first love. But I want you to notice something. This is not grace running away. This is not grace leaving you. It's you turning away from grace. Mm -hmm. It's you abandoning the grace of God that's been so good to you. It's you abandoning God's will for you and, and, and coming to a place where you have determined, and for whatever reason, not to abide in his presence. Now, maybe a free lunch and free grace, they don't exist. But look at this in verse 8 of Ephesians 1. It says, Which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. He, he picked up your tab. I'm just, if, if I could, I wish I could. I wish I could just, you know, snap my fingers and, and have some sort of a, I don't know, Jesus outfit fall on me and then, then I could come to you and, and, and come, come to your table and take the bill that's on your table and, and, and see, you know, see what kind of a tab that you've rung up. And say, don't worry, I got this. And I take it and I hang it on a tree. Wait, that's what Jesus did. He yes. said, listen, you've rung up a big debt. Mm -hmm. You can't pay it. No. There is no way for you to reconcile this debt. There's no amount of effort, no amount of love, no amount of things that you could do to reconcile this debt. But Jesus is telling you, God is telling you, the Holy Spirit is telling you, through faith, you have been lavished with a free gift. Mm -hmm. And what happens too often? Well, I'll just say one thing that happens. Our flesh. 
How many of you woke up this morning in the flesh? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, how many of you glad you woke up this morning Amen. and took the breath of life Amen. in the flesh? Yes. Aren't you glad that God gave you this carnal, this this body, this this vessel that He's given to us? But have you not noticed? I'll go back to what I said. This thing called grace, this this faith, all this. God says, I'm not going to let you no you can't even think that you can do this alone i know it can't be done go from the very beginning from the old testament all the way through the new testament and over and over and over you're going to hear the same thing where jesus is saying listen come unto you me all you are burdened and heavy labored and you're going to find out that even before that he's just he's just personifying in the flesh what his father said return to me. Return to me. Would anybody like a little bit of freedom? Would anybody like a little bit of this free grace that's already been bought and paid for? Yeah. It is free. It's a free gift. Amen. What do you got to do for it? Here's what I, I, I can tell you. What we have to do, we have to respond to it. So as we're going through and in and, and this coming in this coming week, as, as you're going through your seeking him devotion, you'll be going through that and you'll be studying about grace. Let me tell you what it's preparing you for. Grace is preparing you to become holy people, holy priests and priestesses. Oh, oh listen, a peculiar people, because you're not going to fit it. Some of you need to understand something. You're not going to fit in for a whole entirely different reason. Because it's going to be for the glory of God. Not the glory for you or me. But for his good pleasure. Over and over and over. In him we have redemption. It was his grace. That he made a bound towards us. That, that it was for his will. According to his mystery. The mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure. Which he purposed himself. God himself has got a great plan. If we will only just get on board and follow that plan. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's because of the work that was accomplished on the cross of Christ. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Would you just stand with me right now so we can go to the Lord in prayer? And we're gonna we're gonna discuss some of this here in just a few moments. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we gather. And Lord, we thank you, God, that we have such grace, great grace. And Lord, we understand as, as I look over the verses that we've been studying over the past couple of weeks as we started out to break up the fallow ground for it's high time for us to seek you, Lord, until you come and reign righteous. Lord, I, I love that verse. You will reign righteousness on us. We, can't, we don't have anything we can bring you. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to you. And Lord, the, later we, we understand that for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled Yes. And he who humbles himself will, will be exalted. Be Father, I am humbled just by the, the, the idea that you have called me to, to be your spokesperson. But Lord, help us, Father, when we want to do these things. But Lord, we still have things in our life that we have concealed. As the scripture says in Proverbs 28, 13, Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to repent. Not just to stand before you and say, Lord, I, yep, you're right, I'm, I'm a guilty sinner. But Lord, I thank you that you've given me something and someone to help me turn my life around. And so tonight, Lord, I ask that, Lord, that you would create in us a clean heart yes, and yes. renew a right spirit within me. Yes. And the church, agreeing with this, all wanting this, realize that what we want to do is what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, thank you that we know that we have someone we can call upon. Lord, we thank you, God, for this body of believers, the body of Christ. And Lord, I thank you for those that we are affiliated and acquainted with outside of our own small group of people here in New Buffalo. I thank you, God, that they help us, help us keep our foot on the right path of righteousness. And Lord, though sometimes the road seems lonely, the road seems long. The road seems rough. Yet, God, you seem to be able to make 
make straight those ways and to, to, bring, uh, to bring water into deserts. And Lord, that you can make the impossible possible. Nothing is impossible with you. And Lord, as I think of myself, and I believe tonight, Lord, that there are many here that would agree. How is it that you can take a sow's ear? Or how is it that you can take a stone and make bread? How is it that you can make it worth anything? Well, apparently you are God. You've created us. You already have a plan for us. Tonight, Father, I pray for a, a, a blessing that, God, that your presence would permeate the minds and the hearts of all those who would hear in this gathering tonight and all those who would hear this message. That, Lord, that you would show us, hallelujah, how much that you love us. And, Lord, you said that if we love you, we'll keep your commandments. Lord, not only do you give us commandments, but you help us to keep them. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for that provision. Yes. Thank you, God. For that opportunity to become people greater than we ever thought we could because you you Lord you strive to bring to us that same gift that you promised from generation to generation from Genesis to Re Revelation you promised to make a dwelling place for us you promised Lord to be with us always so father be with all these people as they're coming to seek us and they're coming to seek you and they're coming to find peace when there seems no peace. They're coming to seek, Father, peace that, that goes beyond our understanding. And Lord, that peace is none other than you. We yes. thank you in Jesus' name. And church agreeing said, Amen. 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 Brother Harold, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, two words. That I